Now, um, we, we've got a, I think we've got a microphone that can be passed around, but let me open the floor for questions and comments. I expect to have a lot. Okay, let's start uh, in the very back here. I'll take uh, three or four to start off with, and, and please identify yourself, and also if your question is addressed to a specific panelist or not. I work with Plan International, and I'm Puni Krishna. Sir John Holmes, uh, when you listed out the challenges, you also mentioned that there has been relatively better success when it comes to disease control, water, food assistance, compared with shelter and protection. Could you give What's your analysis on why this was a better success? You know, what were the enabling factors which helped to make these interventions a better success compared with the other interventions you were mentioning? Right. Um, let's take uh, this lady here. Mm -hmm. My name is Sarah Muscroft. Sorry, my name is Sarah Muscroft. I work for OCHA. I happen to be the deputy head of OCHA for from March onwards, and then the acting head of OCHA. So, of course, I've got opinions on everything, but <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe to John, Ross, and Linda. Um, one of the things that we that none of you really touched upon, although Ross mounted it, and uh, Ross mentioned it, and you, you alluded to it, Linda, but is <coughs> the whole issue of consistency of staffing. So, so in my view, <coughs> many of the issues that you flagged up problems of information management, the lack of strategic vision, um, uh, the inability to get government properly engaged, etc., are all rooted in the mm. fantastically high turnover of staff. Yes. And I think that what we're doing at the moment is we're masking that in our discussions of leadership. And I think it was it's, it's more extensive than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what you have to say about that. Of course, I have my own opinions on that. but. I mean, I had situations where, I mean, just in the wash cluster, we work with remarkable colleagues, and that should be underscored. Mm -hmm. People came down, and within two weeks, were fully functioning and experts on, on their mm -hmm. particular areas. But we had something like eight wash cluster leads. And I think that's really quite problematic. Um, so maybe we can just talk to, because I think we've got to sort this out in these mega emergencies, and, and you're seeing the same problem now, unfortunately, arising in Pakistan a little bit. And of course, we know that was the big problem in the tsunami as well. I'll leave my one comment to that because I've got thousands more, but I'm going to hold the floor. Okay, so we've got uh, two there. Let's take one from over here. Yes. Sorry, right, Liam. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Robleto. I work for Progressio. I'm the policy and advocacy coordinator. Um, our organization is not a humanitarian yeah. one, but we have programs in Haiti, so I do share the concerns that Linda was pointing mm -hmm. out with regards to uh, staff not being trained to humanitarian affairs, mm -hmm. but being trained on long t longer term development issues. Um, and I think I in terms of mm -hmm. lessons, that is one of the important lessons that we have learned that um, it's very difficult to combine the more pressing mm -hmm. providing for the humanitarian uh, sort of issues and then looking at the more long term. Now, I've got a question for Mr. Holmes, and it's about, uh, you mentioned uh, the situation of the certain issues being very specific to Haiti. I would like, if it's possible, to elaborate on that. And the other thing that I'm, is quite noticeable is that none of the speakers mentioned the role of the Dominican society, Dominican Republic society and the Dominican Republic government. I think that's another important lesson that we can learn from it, because the response that happened truly after the earthquake from the Dominican Republic into Haiti was quite remarkable. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> Interesting mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more on this round, and uh, we'll take this gentleman back in the back. I'll come back to you after we give our uh, My, my name is Richard Brown. This is a question really aimed at Sir John. Um, he mentioned the issues of reconstruction and relief and the fact that it wasn't a he decided in the end to have a joint leader to cover both, but it took a long time to get to that decision. I just wonder, actually, had the international community decided to have uh, separate leaders very early, the focus on reconstruction and planning for reconstruction would have started on day one rather than day 40 or whenever it did, and therefore we, wouldn't, we would have a much better focus on reconstruction now. It, it seems to me that history tells us Relief always takes precedence over reconstruction because people inevitably want to save lives, and then you end up downstream with a big planning problem. 
And I just wonder whether, in, it actually in retrospect, having that joint leader was the right decision. In fact, having separate leaders completely focused on their task at hand strategically would have been a better way forward. Okay, let, let's take those four to, to start off with so we can remember uh, who they were and what they were. Um, I think quite a few of those were, were addressed to you, Sir John. Would you like to start off and then we'll ask Ross and Linda maybe to, to talk about, um, respond maybe to Sarah's question. Is it Sarah? Is that right? Yeah. Well, thank you. I, um, yeah, I'll try to be brief because obviously if we go into lots of detail of three panellists, that'll be the end of the questions if we're not careful. Um, why were some... Um, sectors more successful than others? Well, I mean, a, the answer is complicated, obviously. I think some of the issues are simpler than others. I mean, water and food are relatively simple in some ways. I mean, once you've got the basics right, you can provide it. Shelter, as I suggested, is a very complicated issue because it's, it is connected with all sorts of other issues about land tenure and, and the urban environment and so on. I mean, food and water were complicated by the urban environment but, and took time to get right, but once you've got them right, they're easier. Uh, so I think that's part of it. Part of it is also that you know, some cluster leads are better than others, either as organisations or as individuals. I mean, that's just a fact of life. And we did struggle, particularly with shelter camp management. Uh, we had to change the cluster leads at one point, uh, not long, long, long into the, the problem. So that, I think that helps to explain it too, but it's, it's, you know, there's no simple answer, but I think those are part of it. Uh, Sarah's point, consistency of staffing, I mean, I didn't mention it, but you're quite right, it is a huge problem. And I think all organisations have it. We certainly, Ocha has it in spades. Um, what, what Sarah's getting at is that you send out your first wave of people who spend you know, maybe three weeks, maybe six weeks, then you have another wave who spend another six weeks, maybe. Uh, by that stage, you should have had your permanent staff in there, but you don't. You normally have a third wave of people who are going out temporarily as well. Uh, and this just causes a huge problems of, of continuity and gaps and lack of skills and so on. Uh, and we do have to get it right. I think all the organisations recognise that after Haiti, that they had to look at their surge capacity management uh, in, a, in a different way uh, and get this right. But it's, it's one of those things which sounds easy but is actually quite hard because what you do is you send out the people you think are going to cope best in that emergency situation, but you've got to get them back again afterwards because they have proper jobs as well. Mm. Um, so it, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds, but I think it is a, you're quite right to point it out as a very basic problem. Um, some of the Haiti-specific issues, again, I don't want to go into detail. I think the urban environment, the, the way in which the earthquake decapitated so many of the organisations which Linda mm -hmm. was talking about were, were specific, uh, a very badly prepared, very dysfunctional society and government and so on. Um, so I think some of those things were there. These issues of land and land tenure, they arise elsewhere, but I've never seen them in as acute a form as they are in Haiti, for example. And the Dominican Republic response, were quite right, was, was amazing, in the, given the hostility between the two countries and the two populations before that was amazing and I, I just hope that that reconciliation rapprochement which has happened will continue because I think it will be very important for the future of the island as a whole. And finally on what we've done better with the separate um, humanitarian and, and uh, development coordinators, I think probably the answer is yes we would have done um, but you know there were very strong views about this on both sides of that argument and there still are and there will be next time um, <laughs> because there was a very strong counter argument that as soon as you separate it you're asking for trouble, you're asking for dysfunction, lack of coordination. Um, I mean, I don't think it's actually true that the, the reconstruction side got neglected at the beginning because everyone was focusing on that, you know, or not from day one, but, you know, from a couple of weeks in, the PDNA was beginning to start already, and, you know, as, as Linda was saying, maybe it was too fast because it was very, well, very quick and dirty in the end. Um, but, uh, you know, the issue is, can one person manage both? And the answer is probably not, but it has some advantages. So that argument will go on, I'm afraid. Now, would you like to add anything on those, or would, shall we ask for more questions? Would you like to add something? Uh, just, just very yeah. quickly, the, the, uh, I think the, the issue of uh, consistency of staff, of course, that's quite correct. I wouldn't lose track, however, of the leadership issue. I mean, the leadership issue, there is one thing for being a good water technician, and there's another thing being able to coordinate uh, the water cluster, particularly if it's got 400 people. You know. Um, everybody thinks coordination is easy until they do it. <laughs> <laughs> Linda. Yeah, no, I mean, sir, you're absolutely right. The consistency is difficult, but I think it's hard because, I mean, okay, I'm sure every other industry will say this too, but most of us are doing a couple of people's jobs anyway. And then when you have to pull people away, um, it, it becomes even more difficult. Um, but and going back to the, the, the cluster lead issue, I, 
it was very interesting to me that in, in September uh, 2005, when they were actually assigning the cluster leadership to different agencies, you know, the fights that happened, like, no, this is my area, this is my area. And I think those folks need to be made to, you know, to sort of fulfill the role that they, you know, so eagerly jumped into by providing staff in a timely manner and, st and consistent staff and staff who know, you know, who know what they're doing. And if, if they're going to be rotating people out, there needs to be some overlap. Because I think we saw some folks, you know, in two weeks, out two weeks, in two weeks, and that, that makes no sense. And it, it, it's difficult for the folks going to the cluster meetings because nothing ever moves forward in them. Just on one point, there was, mm -hmm. a, there was also a big problem about the, the staff virtually all the staff who were there had been traumatized mm -hmm. so you know there was a decision at some point that we, all those staff need to leave um, because they, they they can't function properly which is probably the right judgment but as soon as you do that you lose continuity and consistency and local knowledge enormously mm -hmm. so again we were trying to grapple with those issues mm. at the same time which didn't make anything mm -hmm. simpler very difficult <coughs> liam do we have uh, any comments or questions from our uh, online yeah, thanks, Wendy. We've got a quick question from Rosalind Pease of Transparency International, who says, what is being done to address transparency and anti-corruption in post-earthquake aid? The unit for this plant in the IHRC has been rather emasculated. <laughs> right, who would like to <laughs> attempt to address that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think obviously there is, isn't uh, everybody's very conscious of the, the corruption problem and the transparency issues that are there. Um, I mean, various mechanisms have been put in place to try and make sure that the money is being tracked and therefore it's gone to what it's supposed to go to. Um, I think there's a, a committee of, of Haitian civil society which is supervising this, and of course the international community is very worried about this too. The only thing I would say is that you know, if you obsess about this point too much, you finish up where we started in Haiti, which is bypassing the government, disempowering them, uh, condemning Haiti to, to being dysfunctional um, for good. So you, we probably have to take some risks that some money will go missing, but you have to you, you have to go through the government and not try and leave them out. Right. Any any others? No. Okay. Let's uh, have more from our audience here. I'm going to start again over here, lady in the green. Kate Crawford, <coughs> Care International. I just wanted to come back on this idea that one of the things that show it's slowing down progress in the shelter sector is the land tenure issues in Haiti. I'm not sure that's true, actually. I would say it's the other way around, and that the dominant solution in shelter is not at all adapted to the land situation in Haiti, particularly urban areas. Um, transitional shelter kits, which are for one single family, one single story, it's not very well adapted for multi-story damaged buildings in highly dense urban settings and we as the shelter sector have neglected all other things like repairing buildings or supporting host families outside Port-au-Prince. And I'll, I'll just mention that Kate and her colleagues uh, have uh, written an article which appears in the exchange on some of these uh, land and shelter issues so I urge you to, to read that. Right, um, Ken. <coughs> Ken Caldwell, uh, former international director of the children now working independently. Uh, Ross, you were uh, noting the importance of new technology and the importance of involving the local community more. Uh, a number of us have been working on looking at whether we can make a breakthrough in terms of uh, using new technology to enable beneficiaries to know what they're entitled to, to be able to have a channel for redress and to make the agencies responding publicly accountable for doing that. Do you, the panel, see that as part of the future picture? And if so, uh, in what way? Uh, should we take a few questions and then, or would you prefer to respond now? Yeah, well, just, yeah? Just okay. Uh, let's see, let me, Samir? Yeah, Samir Hawaii from HPG here at ODI. Um, just a quick question. I mean, we've spoken today about Haiti as kind of a natural disaster context. Now, I'm not very familiar with Haiti, but I'm also aware that there's an ongoing kind of peacekeeping slash stabilization mission in Haiti. And I was just wondering whether you could make a few comments on the relationship between the two and how they've affected each other. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Rafael, head on Household Energy Network question for Sir John and uh, Linda. Um, 
John, you mentioned briefly about uh, the problems with uh, sanitation, and obviously our interest is on energy. So could you both elaborate on uh, how the energy aspect uh, was tackled? We know that uh, Haiti has uh, had uh, uh, already very big problems with energy. There wasn't one place in Port-au-Prince in which you had energy supply mm -hmm. for during the day, uh, even before. And charcoal is obviously the main uh, source mm -hmm. of energy, which is the reason why uh, cyclones uh, are then so uh, problematic when they come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, look. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. No, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add mm -hmm. that uh, um, we uh, are publishing a, uh, in the next issue of Boiling Point, uh, our journal is uh, on uh, emergency um, energy in the context of emergency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's take one more and for this round, and then we'll carry on. Yes. Thank you, Nigel Timmons, Christian Aid. Um, the issue of local actors uh, strikes me as a systemic and self-replicating uh, issue, not specific to Haiti. Uh, and I'm interested in, in the panel's views on what are the blockages and the system issues as to why why that is the case. I have my own views, but uh, for example, the increasing trend for donors to put pressure on admin burdens, I think, is going to increasingly drive more money going through mm -hmm. a relatively small number of kind of mega NGOs or these very big NGOs, further excluding local actors. But there are probably other systemic issues within the system. I'd be interested for the panel's comments on what those are and how we might challenge them. Okay, let's, uh, let's have the panel address those questions that we have so far, and then we'll see if we can do a few more afterwards. Who would like to go first, Ross? Okay, two, um, uh, two three quickies here. Uh, one on, on, on Ken's issue on, the, uh, on, on beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the issue of the communications, feedback, uh, is certainly something which, as you say, has been brought up time and time <laughs> again, um, and that's... Uh, it, it sort of rejoins the, the last question here about how we get greater involvement of local action, uh, of local actors, capacity building, uh, and so on. Um, that will certainly be part of what we're looking at. Um, whether we'll come up with any better solutions uh, uh, than have been found before, um, let me invite you and indeed others to make submissions to the. Uh, to the review committee because we are very open to, to proposals on that. Perhaps just picking up on the on the last one, the um, the local actor involve actors involvement. It's probably it's this speaks to the anticipation aspect that I think both John and I emphasized in our remarks. The the disaster risk um, uh, prediction um, building local capacity. Um, it's probably a little bit late if you've got a disaster breaking to uh, start to try and, um, and train an organization that hasn't done this before. Um, one hopes, I think, that the international NGOs will partner and thereby in the process of working together build, build that capacity. But in fact, one wants to see this being done, done earlier and before, and I, uh, I just have to believe that uh, this whole business of anticipation uh, does need to be a, a, an issue that uh, will get quite a bit of attention not just in our review, but, uh, but uh, in the community at large. Um, the peacekeeping thing I could perhaps leave to, to you, John, but it's <laughs> just to, to note that um, I can say this, uh, that the integrated mission issue is, of course, a broad one. Uh, there are pluses as well as minuses, but I think in Haiti you had a specially dysfunctional integrated mission. So I wouldn't uh, use that as the uh, litmus test for, um, for all of them. Thank you. Sir John? Thank you. I mean, very quickly, again, on the shelter point, I, mean, I think uh, I don't disagree with what you say. I think the, the shelter issues, the more you looked at them, the more complicated they got, was my impression in Haiti. Um, and we had all, you know, a lot of difficulty understanding why people weren't going back into houses, which seemed to be perfectly OK. But then you discovered they didn't own them. They rented them, and they rented them in rather curious circumstances. And they were worried that if they left the camp, they'd lose their entitlements to whatever aid was going around. So you know, it did get very, very complicated. Uh, and when you looked at areas which were being cleared of rubble, and when you put a transitional shelter back on them, who was going to go into <coughs> it? Because who did that land belong to before? Even if you could tell, because the, all the 
usual markings are gone. You know, these are very complicated issues, and I'm, you know, we were struggling all the way through, and probably still are, I suspect, to, to get some of these things right. On the communications point, um, you know, I think there are some things beginning to happen on this front now, um, you know, using mobile phone technology. I mean, obviously, it, in some circumstances, uh, a lot of victims don't have mobile phones, but, but elsewhere they do. And there's some very interesting work going on, I think, in Somalia, where you can't monitor where aid is going, but you can get feedback from some of the communities on whether they got anything, and that's one way of checking. So I think you know, there are some interesting things going on there. On the peacekeeping mission, I mean, MINUSTA is not a classic peacekeeping mission because there isn't a conflict going on. It was a, <laughs> you know, I mean, there was, a, I mean, often before the earthquake, you know, we would ask, well, why is there a peacekeeping mission there at all? Because it, it wasn't obvious. Um, well, all right, but I mean, yeah, okay, stabilization mission. Um, but it had a lot of people in it. <laughs> um, and it was very expensive. But I think, as Ross said, it, 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 I mean, it had advantages that when these disasters happened, either the, the hurricanes in 2008 and before that and all this, the earthquake, you had people there who could help in different ways, provide logistics, provide security, and it would have been much more complicated without them. But the way the, the mission functioned with, for example, the development and, and humanitarian actors before was not helpful. Uh, I mean, it was a dysfunctional mission. I think it's fixed now, but uh, it wasn't fixed for a long time. Um, I wasn't quite sure about the link between you making between sanitation and energy, but were well, they two separate questions? No, no, no. Since you mentioned the sanitation, I'm not going to... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> well, I think the energy point is fundamental, because the reason, uh, one of the reasons Haiti is so vulnerable is because there's no forest cover, and the reason there's no forest cover is because people use charcoal to cook, and no one's found <laughs> a different way of doing it. And until you <laughs> fix that problem, which, as they fix it on the other side of the border, uh, we're going to go around in circles and every hurricane will be a massive mm -hmm. risk for Haiti. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a fundamental problem, actually. And um, I think the, the only solution I've been able to think of, but uh, it's, it's the, the government tend to dismiss it, is you have to provide an alternative cooking method, which has to be bottled gas, which means you have to have a distribution system, you have to subsidize all that and change everybody's habits. And it can be done. But you know, uh, until you do that, then you're, you're, you're simply very vulnerable to all of the heavy rain that, that happens in Haiti. What about the energy in the camps? <laughs> the operational lights? Well, you have to have generators. There's no, there's no, there's no alternatives mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. There just isn't the energy supplies around, really. Um, yeah. And then uh, just on the local actors, it, I mean, it is systemic. Um, there's all sorts of issues there. One of the things that's, that struck me most in, in discussing it with some southern NGOs, as they sometimes called, is that they say that if you're a humanitarian NGO, a local humanitarian NGO, there are no resources for you until there's a disaster, and then it's too late, and then you have no capacity. Um, so until we find a way of building up the local NGOs who have a humanitarian disaster focus, I mean, and disaster risk reduction has to be part of that, then we're not going to get very far. And I think the big international NGOs have a big responsibility in mentoring local NGOs and really putting something into that rather than talking about it but not doing very much because at the end of the day they are competition, um, if you put it very crudely. <laughs> but I think you know, that, that, that's got to be developed much more. Linda. Yeah, so just quickly, can on the, on the technology and, and beneficiaries and redress, I, I agree there's a certain amount of self-selection if you're doing that all by cell phones, because since we're dealing often with the most vulnerable people, not all of them have that kind of technology available. But I agree with you that we need to think harder about how we make sure that we're reaching out to folks and letting them know that they actually do have an option for, for redress, because we're not that good at that. We're often very busy, but we're not taking the time or using our own national staff or using the community leaders to sit and have those sorts of conversations. So that's something that I think we all agree we need to um, we need to improve on. But I'd love to, I mean I'd love to hear some more ideas about how to use technology to do that in a way that doesn't exclude you know the sort of most vulnerable folks. Um, and Nigel on the yeah on the national uh, the national NGO or, or you know local actor issue that's a really big thing for us and I think the international NGOs really need to own that problem in a bigger way than they, than they do now because we tend to. We tend to work with local actors as a box-ticking exercise for our donors in a lot of cases. 
and we don't really spend time with them to actually help them build up because they are perhaps in some cases ultimately going to become our, benef our, our competition. That our job is to work ourselves out of a job. If we're being responsible, what we're supposed to do is, you know, sort of we're a replacement for a functional civil society in a lot of these places. We should be able to build them up and move back. And I think there's been some innovative work that's done supported by some of the donors like DFID and, and OFDA in different places doing sort of umbrella grants that are managed by an international NGO but send smaller grants out to smaller NGOs that have a, also a, a whole program of building up their or developing their capacity and finance and other things. Um, and, and some of those are actually focusing on disaster risk reduction. So I think those the, the NGOs that you work with on that would be logical partners in a natural disaster response. And we can be a lot more proactive looking at the different places where we know um, bad things are going to happen like Kathmandu. You know, I th we always bring that into the conversation because they're overdue. And we should be reflecting right now, for our folks in Nepal, which is a development context, what kind of relationships do they have with local civil society there? And what are they building in anticipation of the next big earthquake? And so that, I think there's a lot of reflection for us on that one. OK. Um, we're a little bit over time already, although, as I said, the last half hour we were dedicating to coffee, tea, and networking. Are you happy to carry on a little bit longer for a, f a few more questions? There seems to be a lot of interest. Okay, yes, okay. <laughs> Show of hands. Let's take uh, Rachel, because I know she had her hand up for a long time. <coughs> Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Houghton. Um, it's really disappointing to hear that the, uh, the ongoing problems with the clusters, because it seems like we're running out of excuses. This has been around for so long now. Um, do you think it's because the skills required to lead the clusters are not recognized in humanitarian context? You know, they're around soft skills like negotiation, consensus building, brokering relationships and mediation. And if so, how can we actually incentivize this? And I think linked to this is the uh, issue of, of working in partnership, which Ross mentioned. Because essentially, if we think of clusters as multi-stakeholder partnerships, um, I'm a very strong advocate of much better and more effective partnership working. Um, but there's a core tension between service delivery and process in humanitarian contexts. Um, so again, how could we actually incentivize for better partnership working? And do you think we actually need to monetize it as it has been done in the private sector? Thank you. <coughs> Let's see, who else? This lady here? Hi, uh, it's less of a question, more of an advert. Um, <laughs> at the end. Uh, and this is picking up on what Linda mentioned about um, CDAC. Mm -hmm. uh, I know everyone in here probably loves acronyms, but mm -hmm. just in case, uh, that's communicating with disaster affected communities, um, which Infos Aid, which is partly funded by DFID. So thank you very much, Ross. Um, <laughs> I'm not DFID, independent. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's also part of. Um, we're a, a number of organisations. I'm from the Red Cross, um, and I know the Save the Children and um, UN and Internews are part of it as well. We would like for more organisations to become part of the CDAC group. Um, we're about sharing experience that we have and communicating with beneficiaries. That's both ways, so getting information to them and being more accountable to them. Um, we do have an outreach group to get more people involved so we can start sharing our experience and learning from each other. So do please come and find me at the end uh, if you'd like to exchange email addresses and get that going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This gentleman here. Uh, I'm Jeremy Lovelace from Oxfam. Um, you talked about the um, government, high-level governance, and, and I think it'd be interesting to um, hear your opinions about um, where we're going in the future. I mean, this is obviously a critical point, and I know in the early days, Nigel Fisher and Sarah and people spent an awful lot of time talking to the government, trying to figure out what their plans are, mm. trying mm. to see where we're all going. Then there's you know, the interim commission, the Bill Clinton initiative, and so on. Um, given the fact that we've identified govern government at the highest level as one of the biggest issues here, um, wh what sort of optimism or otherwise do you have for the future? Thank you. And let's take one more. Was there anybody on this side? Yes. I'm Hello, I'm uh, Michael Medley, uh, an independent um, scholar, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, d taking up from Jeremy's point about, about funding and the availability of early do donor funding, I wonder if Sir, Sir John in particular would like to comment about that and whether the pooled funding mechanisms such as the SURF and other sort of reserve um, pooled funding worked well and whether they could have done with a lot more money in them at the beginning. 
Thank you. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll take uh, one more, Annie. And, you know, bear in mind that we have uh, some time afterwards for you to buttonhole the panelists over tea and coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Um, I'm Anne Street from Capod, um, and it was really a, a follow-up question on the pooled funding. Um, to ask you to reflect, you um, mentioned that you thought the funding mechanisms had worked well, but really to ask you to reflect whether you thought that worked well for national actors, particularly national NGOs. Um, and I'm thinking of the uh, ERRF, which I think... Um, distributed something like 78 million between January and July. And yet, I think of that total, only something like two grants were made to um, national NGOs. So, um, yeah, I'd like your reflections on that, thank you. Okay, um, I think we'll have to, have to stop with those. Um, any volunteers? Linda, would you like to go first this time? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, no, Rachel, your, your question on the clusters, is, it's exactly right. I mean, and for those of us who spend <coughs> our lives organizing meetings and convening meetings, I think we'd like to see, you know, the, the, the cluster um, the cluster coordinator sort of job description reflect that a little bit more. You need someone with some technical skills, but what you really need is someone who is well known in the community and is well respected and can make people sit at a table and get a decision out of them because having sat in way too many cluster meetings and hate, I mean, you know, meetings are hard. And if you, if you don't have someone who knows how to run them, you spend an hour and a half talking about absolutely nothing and at the end you have no action items and nothing that's carried forward. And I think those are some, some things that, I mean, some of it's innate, but some of it has to be taught. And I think many of us would prefer to see a little bit more of that and have like your technical advisor on the side, but have someone who can actually um, move things forward. I didn't understand what you meant by monetize though. Can you explain that to me? Oh, well, the supplies that come from the clusters and around what it costs to mm -hmm. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I think we kind of have to work in partnership, but it, it'd be good. I think we really do need to, the cluster agent, lead agencies themselves need to identify people with the right skill sets, and maybe they need to be talking to some of the people who have to participate in the cluster activities rather than just sort of in-house. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There's a lot of work to be done there. I think there'll be a lot of reflection. We'll be reflecting tomorrow in Geneva on these sorts of things. Don't you worry. Um, <laughs> Uh, what else was I going to say? The just to talk, I mean, I'll, I'll just make a quick a couple of comments on the ERRF, and I'll leave it the, the rest to to the other folks. But um, that was a getting the ERRF running in the beginning was it was very difficult. Bec and again, this goes back to the language issue because in the very beginning, all of the materials were only available in English, and there was some understanding. Some of the cluster coordinators were sharing with the cluster participants that they had to apply in English. And that was a big blockage for a lot of the national NGOs, as you might imagine. But we got that clarified very quickly, um, thanks to the good offices of CARE who raised that issue with us. And then we went and talked to the intercluster coordinators at the time, and they said, no, 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 that's not the case. And so we sent the message out. But I think, you know, for folks who aren't used to doing proposals, you know, kind of bureaucratic kind of proposals, which you have to do for all donors, it, it was difficult. And there were um, the the folks who were there working on the ERF had offered their you know their time to sit down with people and help them, but they were getting so many requests it was quite difficult. Um, and I think this goes back to what to Nigel's point, which is if we can be preparing good local actors ahead of time, then they they'll be more ready to you know to participate in that sort of thing. Thanks, Linda. Sir John. Thank you. On the the clusters, I mean, I think the you, you point to a very important problem, which is the skill set required is not what agencies necessarily normally develop. Um, and you know, as Ross said, people tend to sort of look down their noses a bit at coordination until they've actually tried to do it, and they find it's actually quite tough. Um, so I think it's partly about that, and I think that one of the things we did agree after the, the a few weeks of the Haiti experience was, or, or re rather recommend to the agencies, is that they should be writing in these skills mm -hmm. to people's uh, development programs and rewarding them for displaying it. Um, in other words, it goes back to the point I was making earlier about agencies need to regard the people they're sending as cluster leaders and cluster coordinators as really key high-level staff, not as people from the middle level who might want to get a bit of experience doing that while the real people are going to run the operation. That's, that's where the, the, the mindset has to change. And I think, I mean, I hope that after Haiti, it, it has changed to some extent because the, the agencies did recognize that they were not doing this right. They were not putting the resources in the right place. Um, so hopefully it will get better, but I'm, I'm, I can't really speak how 
how much better it's been in Pakistan, which is a very difficult problem, but I think it's, it's definitely there. Um, uh, am I optimistic about the government or not? <laughs> I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter. The government is going to be there, and we have to work with them, and we have to make sure they work well. Uh, and obviously, there are, uh, there are uh, presidential elections about to happen, so I, I guess that's not really helped things in the short term. Hopefully, uh, with some clarity out of that, and hopefully a decent candidate who's elected and so on, uh, that might get easier. Um, but uh, you know, it is a, a constant problem. The, the issue that I found most difficult in a way was with the government was not that they didn't have a plan, but they had several plans, depending on who you talk to. So they were, you know, it was dysfunctional within the government uh, between different, different big players and so on. And if you then added that to the, you know, the plans of the Clinton Foundation and the plans of the International Haiti Reconstruction Commission or whatever it's called, you know, you had just too many plans out there. Well, I, th I mean, there was a big discussion about whether the uh, should the interim commission be a big organisation which is doing what the government should do, which is which is one kind of American-driven view because otherwise you're getting all the problems of transparency and corruption and so on, or should it be a small organisation which is making things happen but doing it through the government? Um, <coughs> we on the UN side strongly took the view it should be the second because that's the better long-term way of doing it, even if there are more risks involved, as I was suggesting earlier. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be very tough. I don't think you know, we should have any illusions about this. But I think it's the only way to go. Uh, you, you cannot bypass the government without creating much bigger problems in the long term. Um, and finally, on the, the, the funding, and I, you know, I do think that, that SURF and so on worked as they should do. They provided some, a quick injection of funds, and then they gave way to all sorts of other funding. On the ERF, um, no, I think it's a valid criticism that not enough money went to the local NGOs. Certainly at the beginning, we had to get we want to get a lot of money out into the action quickly. Um, so you can't do that with local NGOs who, who just don't, don't have the capacity or the projects. So we were handing out large chunks of money to, to big uh, agencies or NGOs to do that. Over time, we should have been going back to more to the, to the smaller local NGOs and the things that they can do well. And as, as Linda says, we have to accept that they're not going to produce perfect project submissions. You know, NGOs and agencies have people whose job it is to write this stuff in order to meet donor requirements. Local NGOs don't, so you just have to have a different standard, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can help to train them up, but you have to have a different standard. Again, take some risk, because otherwise you'll never spend any money. Thank you. Ross? Yeah, three quick points, perhaps. One, uh, the cluster uh, aspect we touched on before, it's, it goes beyond, as you picked up, uh, just the technical capacity in the, in, of the individual leading the cluster. Um, there was an NGO meeting last week, and somebody so the clusters aren't working because it took nine months to get agreement on guidelines in the cluster. That's actually not a failure of the cluster, in my view. That's a failure of the leadership in the cluster because it shouldn't take nine months to do that. So um, there, you know, you do need the kind of management, leadership, coordination experience in the cluster as well as elsewhere. Um, on the governance question, um, it, it's fundamental, unfortunately, in. Uh, particularly in, in cases like Haiti, whether you have a natural disaster. It was even more important in Haiti because the rather weak government to start with was, was further decimated, of course, by the earthquake, where I think it was 13 out of 16 ministries were destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and the government, uh, the prime minister, to take the example, um, didn't even have a way of interfacing with the international community to be able to manage the goodwill that was available from the international community. So there are some of us who tried to actually build that in and, and something uh, at least was built up later on. But um, it's, that is a real, uh, a real challenge. And particularly if you, we are, as we all are, looking to reconstruction afterwards, that has to be done with the government. Uh, you, uh, the reconstruction isn't done by however competent, good uh, NGOs or UN agencies. You do need to build the capacity into the government. But uh, sometimes we need to recognize that the government needs help to even manage us when we're out there. Um, the final point I'd make is that I think for all of these uh, aspects, we, we do need to keep centrally that the objective is to reach the population and have impact there. And often we get lost in our coordination tasks of trying to be nice to everybody and so on. We need to keep focused on what it is that needs to be done for the, for the population and the, and the key players. 
Um, and since this is the last time I'm talking here as we go for coffee, uh, I again invite those who wish to make submissions to the, uh, to the HER, the Humanitarian <laughs> Emergency Response Review, not a him, huh? <laughs> uh, um, to, uh, to please <laughs> forward it to Louisa, can, uh, where we can leave, uh, leave the details of that. And uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. No, that's great. Now, I, I'm sorry, I've neglected our online uh, participants here. And I understand there, there might be one or two quick questions. So if we take those very quickly, um, uh, because they can't join us for coffee and tea. <laughs> Liam? Yep. One more question from uh, James Sawyer of WSPA, um, who'd like to know the panel's thoughts on why we are so good at analysing what didn't work, but not learning those lessons and changing, so changing the way that we work in the future. Some lessons here aren't new. Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I think it was mine. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to... Uh, so it wasn't your last uh, opportunity. <laughs> I, I was saying this was my question. Oh, I, I see. That's the point that I was right, making. Right, right, yeah. Uh, but I think John touched on a couple of reasons why uh, well, one did. I, I think some of the points are that it's, you know, it, it mm -hmm. just sounds easy in principle. It's just tough in practice mm -hmm. on the ground mm -hmm. to actually do mm -hmm. some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, but it just means it's, it's not mm -hmm. as easy as it, uh, mm -hmm. it might look to, to outside analysts sometimes. I think um, uh, Ross's point is also right that, that, that you know, the next disaster is a different lot of people, <laughs> and yeah. they haven't learnt it by doing it. Mm. They, they, you know, they can read the reports, but it, mm. that's not the same thing. Mm. Uh, so which is where the organisations have got to have the, the, the culture and the lessons learned. So it's just automatically built into everybody's um, training. I mean, it's, and it's not guidelines; it's real experience on mm. the ground that will make the difference. Mm. Um, so I don't think, you know, as always, there isn't a really simple answer. We have mm -hmm. to do better, um, but it doesn't always, you know, help to be constantly told you just should do this you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes trickier than it looks mm. no I well I I want to bring this session to a close now um, we're we're over time but we still have time to chat more over tea and coffee I want to thank our online participants for coming and everyone who's come here today we're having a smaller round table after this event at 3 30 so those who are coming to that please do stay um, we're going to have tea and coffee over here and organize uh, the rooms over this side, I think. Um, I just wanted to say that um, in terms of learning those lessons and applying them, I mean, this is one of the functions of the Humanitarian Practice Network, is we're trying to give you, provide that opportunity for this to happen. So I hope you will pick up the Humanitarian Exchange 48. I think we've got, in addition to Kate, one or two other authors here, and, and Sir John, of course, himself, who wrote the overview article. So we're always interested in your comments and feedback as well on, on those articles. And uh, we want to thank you again for coming, and thanks to all the panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us. Thank you.